Many of you have been following along with us with respect to this process of industrialization and we know that it is having a profound impact on American life in basically all ways of life. Um, the, the paper that I'm going to uh, assign is going to ask you what industrialization is doing to the institutions of American freedom and equality and uh, how people are responding to it. In other words, is it eroding freedom? Is it stimulating freedom? Is it providing more freedom? And, uh, you know, whatever the case may be, how, how are people responding to it? Today what we're going to talk about is the formation of modern day political parties, things that you and I would recognize. Before we do that though, I, I want you to understand that the formation of political parties was a response to industrialization. How and why? Well, it's actually pretty simple. If you look at an individual like Henry Clay, uh, somebody that wanted to use government subsidies to build things like uh, roads, bridges, canals. We've talked about his bonus bill. We've talked about his American system. Um, at any rate, um, people are beginning to understand that when the government makes decisions, a lot of times that can have an impact on your pocketbook. Um, in a lot of cases, that's going to create winners and losers in the economy. Um, Certainly you can see that in the case that was Sam Patch, and I won't revisit too much of that right now, but just think for just a second about um, Timothy Crane, uh, who is allowed to purchase this uh, plot of land that just so happens to have a waterfall located on it. Well, that waterfall was the place in which individuals like Sam Patch taught themselves how to jump off and, you know, live to tell about it. And so therefore the privatization of land uh, by rich individuals like Crane uh, and the government not really doing anything about that, that, that is seen as, as an issue when it comes to what industrialization is doing and how people are responding to it. Now, let's do this. Let me, let me talk about the way that politics had primarily been running up until the 1820s. For the most part, what you had was notable politicians. Now, what I mean by notable would be somebody born with a silver spoon in their mouth. Um, they had, for the most part, inherited much of their wealth, much of their riches. Now, you had individuals like Thomas Jefferson that were very liberal in the sense that they wanted everybody voting. They wanted everybody to be a part of the democratic process. But at the same time, there was a good bit of deference to Jeffersonian democracy. In other words, you should have a vote, and you should have the right to cast that vote for your choice of two rich and powerful men. The idea that the candidate itself, the future president, for instance, would be drawn from the ranks of the common people would have been completely foreign to somebody like Thomas Jefferson. Okay. Now, if this is sounding a little bit odd and maybe even a little bit confusing. It's because we really wouldn't recognize that kind of individual. Now, don't get me wrong. Most of the people that are running for, you know, positions of, of, of note uh, in national elections, most of them are, are drawn from the upper middle class at the very, very least, okay? But when they're out there on the campaign trail, they don't present themselves as such you know, they, they, they don't tell people that they drive a Porsche or, you know, they eat at the finest restaurants. They try to present themselves as men and women of the people. In other words, they try to present themselves as a populist politician, okay? Men and women of the people. I shop where you shop. I drive what you drive. I wear the same kind of clothes that you wear. I go to the same kind of movies that you like to go to. I am very much like you. Now, the idea of a populist politician was unheard of before the 1820s, but in the process of industrialization, and in particular, the establishment of Jacksonian democracy is going to change all of that. Okay? The simple fact of the matter is we'd reached a time when more and more and more white men were becoming enfranchised, had the right to vote, and it made little difference as to whether or not they owned a scrap of land. So the point that I'm trying to make is this. The numbers clearly favor the working class, the lower middle class. That's where your bulk of your numbers are. It's not with the people that had been born into their wealth. Okay. 
Now, one of the individuals that understands this on a really fundamental level is a guy from New York named Martin Van Buren. Van Buren was a politician, but a, a guy that was really, really savvy with numbers. And what he understood was you only need to get to 51%. That's all you need to do. You don't need to make everybody uber familiar with your candidate. You don't need to make everybody fall in love with your candidate. You just need to find a way to exploit the numbers to the point where you get to 51%. Okay? And after that, it's meaningless because your candidate is going to win, assuming for a second that there are only two candidates running. But anyway, you get the point that I'm trying to make. Okay? Now, Van Buren was a member of the Bucktail Party, uh, like a deer bucktail. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and that's important in and of itself because, first of all, bucktail was relatively easy to remember. But more importantly, what the Bucktails did is they provided a political platform. You know how the Republican Party or the Democratic Party in this day and age has a general platform. It can be boiled down into a sentence or maybe even a couple different sentences, but it's pretty simple. Okay? For instance, in the case of Republicans, what you've got is uh, a much more conservative approach to government, limited government, small government. Um, if you were to go on to the RNC's uh, website right now, right in the middle of the page is something really simple that you can wrap your mind around, okay? So what they're doing is saying, look, if you think like this, right, if this general blanket statement applies to you too, then you would probably be inclined to vote for us. You should cast your ballots for the bucktails when the election rolls around, okay? So it was easy to remember. They, they had a really easy-to-understand platform that was really conducive to, to attracting the bulk of voters. Now, the other thing that they're doing is they're purchasing a paper called the Albany Argus. And I know it's difficult for me or you to understand in the 21st century, but back in the 19th century, newspapers really were cutting-edge technology. I mean, they were the way that you mass-communicated with um, the, the people. And so they were able to put their talking points into the Albany Argus and reach yet more voters. Okay. So the idea of party identity, the platform, and party loyalty, if you believe what we believe, then you should vote for our guy, it, it meant that you didn't need to know Van Buren or whoever was running for office on a really, really personal level. What's his policy on this? What's his stance on that? It just meant that if it says Bucktail next to his name, he must be a pretty good guy. Let me give you one more example before we move on. I venture to guess that many of you have, have voted in at least one election. And I also am willing to bet that many of you identify either as a Democrat or a Republican. Okay, There might be a few others out there, but primarily those are our two parties. Anyway, um, my guess is you probably knew who you were going to vote for, for president, for a senator, for congressman even, before you even got to the polling place. But as you went further and further down the list, and you got to something like drain commissioner or sheriff or even, you probably might not have done the same kind of homework for those, for those candidates, for those positions that you did for some of the more um, well-known races. And so, by and large, if you're like me, you, you look ne next to the person's name. If it's got an R next to it and you happen to be a Republican, you're very inclined to vote Republican. Right? You're very inclined to vote for that guy because he's a Republican, she's a Republican. Same thing for the Democrats. If there's a D next to that person's name and you're a self-identified Democrat, then of course you'd be much more inclined, even though you don't know the first thing about this individual. So this is a really, really effective way of winning elections. Okay? We'll talk about Van Buren a little bit further as the lecture unfolds, but for the time being, what I'd like to do now is talk about another brainchild of Henry Clay, the American system. Now, simply put, the American system was designed to make business in America infinitely easier, right? Make doing business, make the conducting of business, however you want to look at it, make it easier, make it better. It consisted of a series of tariffs, right? Put a tax on British manufactured uh, textiles so that more American consumers would be inclined to buy American. Um, federally subsidized roads and canals. A national bank. I mean, if you think about it, you don't have to think very hard. All of these things are going to make it easier to do business. 
Think about who the American system is going to benefit. What he's asking is everybody to pay into this general fund for a road, for a canal, for a bank. It's probably most directly going to benefit the upper class, right? The, the, the people that are doing the bulk of business, they just so happen to be the upper class, the economic elites. And so in places like South Carolina, there's a lot of resistance to the American system, right? People like John C. Calhoun says, look, I have no you know, ambitions to ever go to Massachusetts, let alone use a road that's going to be built with federally funded dollars uh, in, in, in Massachusetts. So essentially what you're doing is you're taking money from my state, South Carolina, and you're funneling it up there into Massachusetts for something that I'm never going to use. And I don't find that to be all that um, um, beneficial. So there's a lot of resistance to the American system, especially in the American South. Now, the North is another matter, but again, people have come to the realization that when government acts, it does have an impact on people's economic bottom line, okay? So anyway, all of this is leading us into the election of 1824. Now, in 1824, there were five people that were running for president, but really only three that I need you to be mindful of. First of all, you had Henry Clay. Henry Clay had run in 19, or 1824, and he had received approximately 13% of the popular vote. Coming in next was the son of John Adams, former president and the former Secretary of State under James Monroe, a guy named uh, John Quincy Adams. He received almost 31% of the popular vote. Now, the winner of the popular vote would be the military hero of the War of 1812, an alleged self-made man, Andrew Jackson. Okay, Now, Andrew Jackson won over 41% of the popular vote. So from the outside looking in, this looks like a landslide. The problem was he did not win a majority in the Electoral College. We've seen this happen before. When you don't have a clear-cut winner, it goes into the House of Representatives, and the House is going to act as the tiebreaker. Okay, Now, Henry Clay just so happens to be the Speaker of the House at the time, and so he's in a really powerful position. If he wanted to, he might even take up the cause of getting himself elected, because there is no clear-cut winner. To do that, however, he's got to tell, you know, over 70% of the American public, well over that, really, that their vote didn't matter, that even though 13% of the American people voted for him, he's going to completely undo what they did. So it's not a very good option to um, go ahead and try to lobby for yourself. So he needs to choose the next best thing. Andrew Jackson's from Tennessee. He is a little bit of a pull yourself up by your bootstraps type of individual. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But he's probably not going to be overly inclined to do what Henry Clay wanted done with the American systems. Right? I mean, Jackson strikes me anyway as much more of a guy that's like, look, if, if Massachusetts wants a road, then let Massachusetts build the road. Don't ask Tennessee to build the road. Okay? So anyway, um, John Quincy Adams, who not only was from Massachusetts, but was also a notable, understood how and why making business easier in the United States would ultimately, long term anyway, benefit everybody in the United States, at any rate, he's much, much warmer, much, much more um, inclined to support the programs of the American system. So it's John Quincy Adams that uh, Henry Clay throws his support behind when it goes into the House of Representatives. And ultimately, it will be John Quincy Adams that is elected by the House. Now, critics of both the American system and Henry Clay labeled this process the corrupt bargain. I mean, not only did this kind of just smack of some smoky backroom deal that was hatched at the 11th hour, the first order of business after Adams became president was to appoint Henry Clay as the Secretary of State. So this became known as the corrupt bargain, that something had gone south at the very last minute, and ultimately it was the American, um, American people, American democracy, that, uh, that paid the price for it. Okay? So... Um, Henry Clay gets what he wants, which is a president that's pretty much willing to rubber stamp whatever he wants when it comes to the American system. And one of the things that comes out in 1828 um, uh, is uh, a tariff, again, a tax, on cheap British cloth. Now, 
if you live in Massachusetts, that might not be so much of an issue. As a matter of fact, if you live there, people might actually really, really support that, considering it's a major industry and a major, major job provider. If you lived in South Carolina, for instance, it could be a problem, okay? Because essentially, there is no textile industry. You've got a cotton agricultural industry down there, and for the most part, people don't really care about anything else other than getting their cotton to market. Everything else is an afterthought. And so if you are a consumer in South Carolina, what the government has just done is just raise the cost of living. You don't see a benefit from this, okay? American cloth, British cloth, what do you care where it comes from? Just give me the cheapest price. It's a lot like gas, you know? As long as it makes your car go, most of us are going to go to the cheapest price that we can find, okay? Anyway, um, the tariff of 1828 is really going to be a key component of the election of 1828. And the election of 1828 is going to be a rematch between Jackson and Adams. Now, for your notes, John Quincy Adams is going to be the last quote-unquote notable president. A little bit about Andrew Jackson. Yes, he was a war hero. No, he never went to a place like West Point. He just kind of came across it naturally. So is this a situation where Daddy's signing a check and sending him to some fancy college, some fancy military school? No. He's really a self-made man, at least from a military standpoint. He's pull yourself up by your bootstraps, blue-collared, working class. Okay? Furthermore, he's from Tennessee. Adams was from Massachusetts, which was one of your more elitist kind of states when it comes to national politics. Nobody from Tennessee, actually nobody from the Trans-Appalachian uh, Trans uh, Mountain uh, Range Territory, let alone Tennessee, had ever been elected president. So this is also something that's really going to resonate with the American people. And keep in mind, the bulk of the American voters by 1828 is your working class. It's not your John Adams supporters anymore. Okay. Um, lastly, Ad, uh, 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 Jackson was not born into his riches. I mean, eventually he became a rich man and a slave owner, I might add, but he didn't inherit these things, even like the, uh, you know, the, 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 the noble Thomas Jefferson had done. Anyway, what happened in 1828 is Van Buren, uh, in all the way to New York, rallies people to Andrew Jackson's cause. And he does a number of different things, but one of the things that he does that absolutely needs to be in your notes is he starts the Democratic Party. I mean, the Democratic Party, the Big D, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, um, modern-day uh, Democratic Party traces its roots back to 1828, Andrew Jackson and Martin Van Buren. Now, the Democratic, first of all, who couldn't remember something as simple as the democracy or Democratic Party on Election Day? But secondly, it gave it a platform. Okay, you ready? The empowerment of the individual. The empowerment of the individual and a limited federal government. Empowering individuals and limiting the power and scope of the federal government so that you didn't feel government so often and so, you know, forcefully in your day-to-day -day life, okay? A little bit different, a lot different than the modern-day Democratic Party that we see, but we are talking about over a hundred years of political development. So, another story for another class. Back to Andrew Jackson. Not only does he have a very simple, uh, very easy-to-remember political party behind him that makes it a lot easier to get elected um, um, anything, let alone president, but they also gave him a really cool nickname. They gave him the nickname Old Hickory. It was tough, it was imposing, very similar to Jackson. And if it wasn't easy enough to remember the democracy, certainly everybody could remember Old Hickory, okay? So what Van Buren is doing with Jackson is the same thing that he had done back in New York. He's simplifying it to the point where it's you've got a really easy, simple path to get to 51%. And it works like a charm. Jackson takes home 56% of the popular vote. I mean, he leaves nothing to the imagination this time, and he defeats John Quincy Adams, which is why John Quincy Adams is the last notable president. Um, Andrew Jackson had demonstrated, look, if you want to get elected anything, let alone president, you better make the case that you understand what it means to be middle class, that you, you know what it feels like to struggle through working class America. Okay? Jackson vowed to be a president of the people. I mean, he was a president by the people. He was from the people. The masses is what I mean. 
Now, Jackson's election, you have to understand, it means different things for different people. For somebody of the working class variety, somebody like Sam Patch, this is the ultimate manifestation of American exceptionalism. Only in America could somebody like Andrew Jackson be elected president. Only in America could you be born into humble origins and not only rise to become a rich, wealthy individual, you could, you could, you could, you could find yourself in the highest office in the land, if you're good enough, if you're talented enough, if your attitude is right. So from the perspective of Sam Patch, this is a great, great thing. It's what makes America beautiful. But from the perspective of somebody like Thomas Jefferson, this is the great danger of democracy. I said Jefferson, maybe John Adams would be, the first John Adams, I mean, would be a better example. This was a guy that was not only a conservative Republican, small-r Republican, but a guy that said, look, you know, there are good things about democracy, but there are also fundamental flaws. There are things that are very, very popular, but are not very good when you implement them. Furthermore, there are things that are very unpopular at the time that they were brought up, but over the course of time proved to be very, very effective and very beneficial to American life. Okay? But the real problem with the idea of a limited government and the empowerment of the individual, it all goes back to the political culture of the time, or maybe better yet, what's legal at the time. One of the things that's legal is slavery. And so by espousing the idea that uh, the Democratic Party stood for the rights of the individual, if you are an individual slave owner, that means that the government can't tell you what you can or cannot do with your slaves. It's an issue simply because it's going to allow those parasitic classes uh, both the slave owners of the North and some of the people that are, you know, really abusing their power in finances, uh, some of the merchants, some of the factory owners in the North, look, don't tell me how I can or cannot run my factory. If I want to employ an eight-year-old, um, that's my business, and you don't have any place in my business. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's various different ways of looking at Jacksonian democracy, but, but, but ultimately it's going to be a mixed bag, okay? But really, the, the, the more important thing that I need you to understand about this is that this isn't going anywhere. The, the idea of political caucuses and a political party, it's not going to go anywhere anytime soon. And if you, if, you, if, you, if you adamantly oppose, you're not a fan of Jackson or the Democratic Party, it means that you're going to have to find a, a political party of your own. Otherwise, you're going to be risking getting left behind. Okay, and so when we come back, we'll we'll um, we'll we'll be talking about some of the uh, the effects, long-term effects of Jacksonian democracy, and more importantly, the establishment of the Whig Party.